hormone times and resistant temporalities. And I want to start this talk by sharing a personal story. When I was 12, or maybe 13, I started taking hormones for the first time. My mother, and subsequently also my doctor, were concerned with the severity of the menstrual pain I was experiencing, causing me to be unable to attend school, as I wasn't able to stand, sit, or move around, and sometimes even causing me to faint. Consequently, they suggested hormone therapy as a cure. At that time, nobody seemed to question the treatment as the appropriate answer to the pain. Nor did anyone explain to me the effect these molecules might and eventually did have on my body. They were thought of as an enhancement of the chemicals circulating in my body anyways. Nothing to be worried about, nothing that would change the tra trajectories my body was set on by its so-called natural makeup. Taking hormones became an unquestioned daily practice, something I just did without me or anyone else ever questioning it. A yellow pill each morning for 10 years. Skip forward 15 years later. I was sitting in a medical office again, with a different doctor in a different place, talking about hormones again, as an appropriate treatment for what was considered my diagnosis. Only this time, I had to explain my desire to take hormones as a technology of gender transition. It was not considered natural at all, and I had to work to make my claim legible within the doctor's office. Through shared community knowledge, I was prepared how how to narrate that desire in order to access the desired molecules. As I went to the psychiatrist, I told him a story that wasn't my own, about how I've always known that I wasn't a girl, how I always felt discomfort in my own body, how I was feeling more like a man on the inside, none of which was true. I loved being a princess as a child, and I felt, even though I felt bodily discomfort when I was a teen, this was, ra this was rather due to an eating disorder than any disidentification with my gender. And until this day, hegemonic masculinity is nothing I, I strive for. But by now I have reiterated this story so many times that it starts to feel true. Later on, I also had to take a psycho psychometric personality test to de determine if I was fit enough for the gender-affirming technologies I was seeking. Again, I was careful to answer in a manner that would depict me as the gender transgressing, but otherwise law-abiding, norm-confirming, able-minded, and fit citizen, many times actively forcing myself to produce answers that do not conform to my actual experiences in the world or my political beliefs. For example, those tests ask you um, to agree or disagree on statements such as, I would never resist authorities, or the law should be abolished, and I think considering the rise of fascism in Europe and the almost daily uh, passing of racist laws, ableist laws, uh, it seems kind of impossible to answer these questions truthfully. Yet telling the story and producing these answers seemed to be the only way to access the technologies I wanted. Telling the truth and narrating a more complex story about gender identity and the way it, it is shaped and reshaped over time would have most certainly disqualified me from accessing the medical care I wanted. It was only going, after going through all of these visits and telling the story multiple times that I told my mother about my decision to take hormones. Her initial reaction was very loving and supportive, but at the same time she also voiced, and I think continues to do so, concerns about the effects these artificial hormones might have on my body, my health, but also my ability to hold, to hold my job or pursue future employment, as well as the possibilities of being in a loving relationship. In other words, my mother was and is concerned with the effects of these so-called artificial hormones and what she imagines to be a good future. A good future signaled by health, income and relationship status. I'm sharing this story with you for two reasons. First, because I firmly believe in the feminist principle that our own experiences in the world shape the research we are doing and thus that those lived experiences also provide a ground for us from where to start theorizing. And I want to open up this talk stressing the importance to ground trans studies in the tradition of feminist knowledge productions, and especially I'm referring here to black feminisms, indigenous feminisms, feminisms of color, and radical trans feminism. And of course, these all overlap. They all point us to the situatedness of knowledge production, deconstruct notions of, of objectivity, as well as the binary of the personal and the political, and ca call on us, and I'm quoting here Sandy Stone, to take responsibility for all of our history. 
And of course, relating to the situatedness of knowledge production, this experiences that I just shared with you, as well as the talk I will give today, is very much informed by my own position in the world as a white, middle-class, temporarily able-bodied trans person who holds a European passport and has health insurance. Second, by telling you this story, I want to draw your attention to the juxtaposition, juxtapositional framing of natural and artificial hormones, as well as the connected temporal underpinnings that structure these framings, especially regarding notions of linearity, development, progression, as well as futurity. So I didn't get already to do that, sorry. Um, it is these specific notions of time that I want to draw our attention to. By looking at three different articulations of what I want to call imagined hormone times, that is the way time is imagined to be influenced, reshaped and reoriented through hormones, I want to trace the entangled histories of sex hormones to highlight the colonial, gendered, racialized, ableist and national, uh, nationalist underpinnings of trans chrononormativity, as well as offer thoughts on the possibilities of resistant temporalities articulated in trans productions and that undermine hegemonic notions of time. So I've divided this, this talk into three sections that are all parts and parcel of my PhD project and I really hope that you can bear with me because I feel that they are not as coherent as I would like them to be at this point, so I also want to disclose that this is the very beginning of my PhD project. So this is part one. Uh, part one is called Trans Chrononormativity and Hormones as Chrono Biopolitical Forces. So what do I mean when I'm referring to time, temporalities, and chrononormativity? You can see this. This is actually a, a picture drawn by a friend of mine, uh, Nick Bokesh, who also lives in Vienna and does this very amazing comics, I think. Um, so, unlike in any other field, time as a normative structure is highly visible in classical trans narratives. Imagining gender transition as, li as a linear and progressive path from one gender into the other. The classical transition narrative constructs a linear timeline in which femininity and masculinity are constructed as points of departure or destination. For those trans people who can and want to medically transition, and I think it's maybe not necessary to stress that in this room, but of course uh, not all trans people do want to ex have access to medical um, transition. And I think as a community we have to stand against all forms of gatekeeping that also includes the not trans enough narrative that often accompanies those narrations. Uh, but trans people who can and want to medical transition or gain legal recognition, the transition narrative uh, as an autobiographical act often begins in the clinician's office, as Jake Prosser has shown. The linear transition narrative produces a coherent trans subject by piecing together subject subjectivity back through time, that is, through engaging a gender non-conforming childhood narrative, for example, typified by the clothes one did, the clothes one did, did not wear, the favorite toys one played with, or even the gender of childhood friends and crushes. Thus allowing the trans subject, and I'm quoting J. Prosser here, to appear to have been there all along. This narrative is incited through questions such as, have you always felt like a, or since when did you know you are, to give you another picture, I don't know if you can read this. This is uh, a very uh, one of my favorite films called Against the Trans Narrative by Jules Hoskam. I believe you also have a copy of it in the archives, and I strongly recommend it to all of you to watch this movie. I think it's very fascinating. Um, so while this narrative framing uh, signals permanence and stability, the transition narrative, or at least in the first encounters in the clinician's office, also points towards a desired future of, of arrival in what is assumed to be the other gender, which is not yet here. In that way, the narration of the past works to enable the future to come. Thus, the production of trans subjectivity relies simultaneously on notions of stability and permanence, as well as on progress and futurity, on the other hand. This na narrative is constantly incited by gatekeepers, such as medical professionals, state officials, but also by countless others, including encountering trans people outside these professions. Simultaneously, it is, it is reproduced and incorporated by trans people seeking access to medical care or legal recognition. Uh, and this narrative also circulates in popular culture. Um, if we think of the myriad visual representations of trans people um, framed in before and after pictures, 
So this narrative, uh, I would argue, maps transition within the time frame that produces a sense of timeliness of trans experiences. Thus it seems that trans subjectivity and embodiment are made intelli intelligible only through the temporal framing of the transition narrative. And as Natasha Seymour has argued, hormone replacement therapies, surgeries, and I would add legal recognition, and I'm quoting, are given or withheld under a restrictive tele teleological program that writes into the transgender narrative the fantasy of normative futurity. End of quote. That is to say that the temporal framing of the transition narrative reinforces the kind of binary identities that will be recognized by the medical legal complex and can be assimilated into the normative temporalities of the state. In the context of the transition narrative and its embeddedness in the medical legal complex, time functions as a normalizing force, and thus is not the mere effect of power relations, but rather fundamental for the becoming. And um, Elizabeth Freeman refers to this phenomen phenomenon as chrononormativity a term that she uses to describe the way time organizes or binds, and I'm quoting again, naked flesh into socially meaningful embodiment, end of quote. With the concept of chrononormativity, Freeman directs our attention to the ways in which time is implanted into our bodies that make it seem like a somatic fact, while simultaneously organizing individual bodies toward maximum productivity. And I think one of the examples she's giving in her book that I think makes it very... Um, accessible to think of the chrononormativity is the way in which uh, reprodu reproductive time is uh, implanted into bodies so that uh, people get the feeling that their biological clock is ticking. That's one of the examples that makes it very, I think, gives it an image which she means, which says, binding the naked flesh. Um, thus, I would argue that chrononormativity is a central component, component of transnormativity. Producing temporal forms of intelligible, intelligible, I cannot say this word, <laughs> intelligibility and recognition of trans subjectivity. In other words, chrononormativity becomes the condition for recognition and inclusion of trans subjects into the nation state. Therefore, time is not only structuring normativity, but also works as a political, biopolitical force, a technology of chronobiopolitics, to borrow from Freeman once more. In Freeman's conception, chronobiopolitics also refers to the way in which the state creates effects of national belonging, not only through narratives of a shared history, but also through synchro synchronicity and through personal histories, and I'm quoting, that become legible only within a state-sponsored timeline, which then in turn is marked, uh, for example, by birth, marriage, reproduction, accumulation of wealth, and death. Um, Coming back to my opening story, I would like to argue that within the dominant transition narrative and its temporal underpinnings, synthetic sex hormones play a key role in fostering notions of progress and linearity that are essential for the legal and medical recognition of trans subjects. Especially within the dominant framing of trans experiences, the trans subject who does not take hormones or use other gender-affirming technologies is often portrayed as being stuck in the wrong body. And while the wrong body trope has been contested both within the community and within academia, I think less attention has been paid to the notion of being stuck, which is not only a spatial metaphor, but also a temporal one, as it is deferring to notions of being stuck in the past or stuck in a gendered timeline, and ultimately being out of time. Within the trans chrononormative narrative, Medical interventions, and especially hormones, are imagined to either reverse the past and propel the body to move toward a different development, or in the case of puberty blockers given to trans youth, to stall the effects of time in order to enable a better future and thus to fold trans subjects into normative temporalities. To give you a visual example of how hormones operate as a temporal technology or time machine in the context of transnormativity, I want to turn our attention to YouTube transition videos. Um, I think in the last uh, decades, YouTube has become a platform that not only contains music and cat videos and is very entertaining, but it also serves as a site for queer com community knowledge production and sharing. And this is especially true, I think, for the trans community. Uh, I did a search on YouTube last week and I tried to search for the terms transgender and transition and uh, YouTube brought up over 200,000 videos, 
An overwhelming majority of these videos are to some extent concerned with hormones and their effects on the body. Many of them uh, are also titled Transition Timeline or FTM Timeline, for example. The way in which these videos express a belief in the drug as the transformative technology, as Arm has said, um, corresponds with the two hegemon hegemonic discourses on who trans people are and why we exist, defining us as either subjects engaging with transgender technologies, such as hormones, or explaining our existence through the exposure to hormones in the womb. Either way, both discourses agree that hormones are what makes a trans person trans. Understanding transition as a chemical rite of passage, which of course is a very problematic, narrow, medicalized and Eurocentric understanding of trans identities. Analyzing the transition, these transition videos under the lens of temporality, Laura Horrock argues that these videos operate according to a temporality she calls hormone time. She argues that in, the, in an analogy to Christian concepts of time, the transition videos fix the first day of hormone replacement therapy as the starting point against which time or even history is measured. Um, and I think, for example, uh, if you think of all these transition videos, many of them start with a person uh, saying, so this is my first day on testosterone, for example, and then you have these videos that go on to show, so it's three months now, it's six months, it's a year, and they're always measuring time backwards against this first day of starting to take hormones. Uh, and they also use a lot of temporal compressions and before and after juxtapositions, um, and thereby attempting to visualize the performativity of hormones within the framework of a progressive and linear temporality. Thus, hormone time in Horrocks' conception is linear, progressive, teleological, and even utopian, as it points to, towards a future embodiment that only retrospectively is framed as achieved. And even though I agree with Horrocks' assessment of the workings of hormone time in these accounts, it is important to note that the very same technologies may be put to work in order to produce oppositional temporal effects on bodies that are positioned differently, and that might seem less utopian. So while temporalities invoked through hormones are framed as liberatory within normative trans narratives, this might not be true for other bodies deemed as out of time. And I'm thinking here, for example, of the case of a young girl uh, considered as severely disabled by her parents and attending doctors who has become known uh, by the pseudonym Ashley X. I don't know if this was also in the news in Canada as well. Um, so Ashley X uh, was, without her consent, uh, given the same puberty blockers that supposedly enable a good future for trans youth in order to arrest her development and keep her in the state of permanent childhood, which in turn was framed as an intervention to align her body with her mind. And uh, just to point you there, um, Jake Pine and also Alison Kafer have written very extensively on this, and I can really recommend reading their work on Ashley X. Another example of the temporal violence operating through sex hormones is the non-consensual sterilization of intersex children and babies, whose bodies are deemed as chrono-abnormalities in the framework of what Emily Grabham has termed the cascading time of sex development. And by that she refers to the ideas um, the, of hegemonic biology, um, how sex develops in the fetus and how there's, it starts with one um, gland and then it develops into two different kind of um, sexual um, sex traits. Sorry. Um, and those children are often being put on hormones in order to assimilate their bodies into the Western gender binary and the accompanying temporalities. In both of these examples, the violence is legitima legitimated in reference to hegemonic ideas of a good future. <coughs> One that is unambiguous in terms of gender and in which disability does not have a place. And the, the power ascribed to hormones to bring these futures into being. Therefore, I would like to propose to think through hormones, time and the tra trajectories of trans normativity through a wider range of texts and artifacts in order to show the different linear and non-linear temporalities invoked through hormones and the violence these discourses legit legitimated.
Viewed in a broader historical and discursive con context, the transition videos can be seen as part of a larger cultural archives of hormones, in which certain bodies are framed as progressive and moving towards the future, while others are made abject, constructed as developmental errors, or as stuck in, not, in a not quite human condition. For these reasons, I would like to propose to think of hormones as chronobiopolitical forces with Elizabeth Freeman, and that is to say that hormones work to fold certain bodies into normative timelines, while others, other bodies are deemed as out of time. And in what follows, I want to offer you my thoughts on the history of sex hormones and the different temporalities invoked through them, highlighting the colonial, gendered, racialized, ableist, and nationalist entanglements of transchronomativity. So this is my second part. How am I doing on time? So you're still alive for one. Okay. Um, so my second part is called uh, Entangled Histories and Temporalities in the Trans Hormone Archives. Uh, for that purpose, I want to turn to another visual account of hormones performativity that I encountered in the archives. The film that I want to discuss uh, was produced in the context of the so-called golden age of research in sex hormones in the 1920s, a time when several European researchers and pharmaceutical companies were in a race to be the first to isolate sex hormones, which were considered to be the essence of femininity and masculinity. For that objective, enormous quantities of animal and hum human urine were trafficked all over Europe, collected at farms, police stations, psychiatric hospitals, and gyne gynecological clinics. The quest to isolate hormones included other raw materials as well, such as tons of ovaries and tes testicles collected in slaughterhouses in Europe, or gained through massive hunting expeditions in the colonies. And it also encompasses even an entire blue whale that was being shipped to a laboratory in the UK, I think, to harvest its uh, ovarian tissue. Among the researchers aiming to isolate sex hormones was Austrian scientist Eugen Steinach. In the 1920s, he conducted research on human and animal testes and ovaries at his Institute for Experimental Biology, located in the Venus Prater. And for those of you who don't know Vienna and don't know what the Prater is, it's um, a very big park that was an amusement park um, that also uh, hold, um, hosted um, freak shows, for example, and that also um, was the place where um, for example, African villages were explained. So this is a place that is already structured a lot by a very, uh, very colon, colon, colonizing gaze, I would say, and a very violent gaze. So, and his institute was located in the midst of this location, just to give you an idea of it. Um, no, I've lost it myself, yes. Um, and he was also later in the 1920s contracted by the German pharma company Sharing to help them win the race to isolate sex hormones. Um, in many ways, Steinach was also very influential for the conceptualization of modern-day transgender healthcare, as he counted among his friends not only Markus Hirschfeld, but also Harry Benjamin, who visited Steinach every summer in Vienna during the 1920s. And Harry Benjamin, I think I don't have to mention in this room, is of course known to be the founder of the first gender clinic in the US and also the writer of the transsexual phenomenon in, the 19, in 1966. Um, and still one of the main intellectual forces behind what is today the standards of care. Until his death, Harry Benjamin considers himself a Steinach disciple. This is just to give you a little bit of an introduction of the film I want to uh, consider, and just very briefly. Um, the film was called um, The Steinach Film, and it was intended as an educational film for a lay audience, while the scientific version uh, aiming at medical professionals was also produced separately. Uh, the film was produced in 1922 by Kurt Tomalia for UFA, and the film was quite a success when it opened in German cinemas in 1923 but it also circulated beyond Germany, and I think uh, that also Harry Benjamin organized the screening of the film in New York, as far as I know. Um, at that time, sex hormones haven't been successfully isolated yet, uh, therefore the film is primarily concerned with what was then known as the inner secretions of the puberty glands. And it aims to explain their effects on different bodies and to promote Steiner's theory of regeneration through surgical intervention that also became known as Tu Steinach, and so it just his name became known as, as the surgery. The film sets out to explain to the audience the workings of the inner secretions in six parts, 
ranging from Steiner's general theories of hormones, experiments on animals, to a showcasing of human abnormalities, ranging from what we would now call intersex bodies, effeminate men, masculine women, and people with disabilities. And the film closes with his theories of regeneration and examples of successful medical intervention to reverse the effects, effects of aging. In setting out to explain Steiner's theories of hormon hormonal imbalances as the root causes for all kinds of pathologized bodies, the film creates an uncanny visual and argumentative relationship between animals on which all kinds of experimental surgeries are performed, either aiming to restore their youthfulness or change their, effect, their sex, and the non-normative bodies of those who, who, as the film suggests, might be cured from homosexuality, gender ambiguity, and disability through the same procedures. And I don't want to reproduce um, the very violent images of the film, but I just wanted to give you this um, film still. That is uh, an example of the animal experiments that Steinach did, so it's showing a castrated uh, guinea pig, two so-called feminized guinea pigs, and one that I would say is a cis male guinea pig, just to give you an example of the way the film portrays animals also. Um, watching the film for the first time a few weeks ago with my friend Nick, um, who did the comic that I showed you before, uh, in the Austrian film archives, I was quite stunned by the visual proximity the film establishes between animals and non-normative bodies coded through categories of disability and queerness. And I would argue that in creating this visual proximity, the film represents these bodies as not quite human, hormonally defective and backward, while simultaneously somehow suggesting that they might enter into the category of the human, and also the associated temporal tra trajectories of futurity and national progress through the performativity of hormones as a straightening device, to quote Sarah Ahmed. The imagined hormone time present in the film and the linked understandings of hormones as being able to intervene into temporal trajectories and reinstate normative temporalities becomes especially clear in the last part of the film, when Eugensteiner theor Eugensteiner's theories of regeneration are laid out. Steiner's theory relied on the framing of hormones or inner secretions as the essence of sex and testosterone as the essence of virility. Therefore, he argued that performing what we would now call a vasectomy would increase the amount of testosterone produced and preve prevent it from exiting the body, thereby keeping the body young, prolonging life, and eventually even cheating death. Visually, the film operates in ways that resonate with contemporary YouTube transition videos, through the before and after images that reinforce the imagined performativity of hormones. And this part of the film frames hormones as a way to successfully restore a lost masculinity and thereby securing the reproductive future and health of the nation. Narrating the success of regeneration through images of men regaining their ability to lift heavy beer barrels and climbing mountains, and I think the, la the, the latter, of course, is also speaking to notions of uh, white masculinity in a colonial setting. Um, the film also creates an utopian vision of the temporal performativity of hormones and promises a better future in a time of deep national crisis. So we have to contextualize the film also in the area shortly after the First World War. And Maria Makila argues that, um, and I'm quoting again, with scores of injured veterans on the streets and a psyche damaged by the humiliation of defeat, the nation was intrigued by the promise of regeneration. Even if, not, even if not everyone bought into it. So the Steiner film frames hormones as boundary markers, I would argue, that demarcates the, borders, the border between male and female, ability and disability, normal and monstrous, young and old, national belonging and its outsiders, while simultaneously depicting medicine's ability to intervene and transgress these boundaries in order to restore the chrono-biopolitical time of the nation. Coming to my last part. Reflecting on these entangled histories of sex hormones from the collection of raw materials in order to isolate hormones via the clinical trials carried out in the colonies and psychiatric institutions to the current production and marketing of hormones within what he calls the pharmacopornographic era of late capitalism. Paul Preciado writes in his popular book, 
a uh, body assay actually, testo junkie. Each time I give myself a dose of testosterone, I agree to this pact. I kill the blue whale. I cut the throat of the bull at, at the slaughterhouse. I take the testicles of the prisoner condemned to death. I become the blue whale, the bull, the prisoner. I draft a contract whereby my desire is fed by and retroactively feeds global cap channels that transform living cells into capital. And I would say that here Preciado is echoing uh, also Mich Michelle O'Brien's thoughts on the connections between the pharma industrial complex, trans people, poor people, and people living with HIV in her very influential essay, Tracing this Body, where she wrote, and I'm quoting again, when I give myself an injection of Delastrogen, I'm locating myself and I'm located within global flows of power. I'm connected to the complex political, economic, and social histories of how these drugs were manufactured and by whom. I'm bound within the international trade system that allows allow those corporations to function, that bring the hormones to my drawer in a brown envelope. By taking hormones, I'm doing what we, we all do in various ways. I'm particip participating within the system of transnational capital. These systems are racist, classist, sexist, homophobic, and transphobic to their core. They are systematically structured on a hatred of bodies of trans people, poor people, people with living, with, living with HIV, and drug users. And yet, all of us are deeply in, inexor inexorably dependent on these very structures. Quite literally, we need them to keep us alive. And I remember very vividly reading Preciado's texts for the first time and being very intrigued uh, by his understanding of being bound up with these histories of endocrinology as well as the present global flows of power and capital operating through those hormones. I would argue that by framing his use of testosterone not, own, not in terms of a medical transition but rather as the title of his book suggests uh, in terms of drug addiction and gender hacking, Preciado positions himself outside the transnormative narrative the medical legal complex, as well as outside of normative temporalities of progress and linearity. And I'm following here also uh, Jack Halberstam's thoughts or argument in A Queer Time and Space, where he argues that the figure of the junkie can be read as a queer subject, living outside of normative scheduling of time. And this queer temporality, I don't know if you have written, uh, if you have read uh, Preciado's book, but I think it's the the queer temporality is also signaled in his style of writing, where the normative linearity of what would be considered academic writing is constantly disrupted by his protocols of taking testosterone, of his accounts of grieving for the loss of his friend, and also uh, his very detailed description of, of his sexual and uh, erotic relationships. So this accounts always cross into the linearity of academic writing. The practice of gender and hormone hacking, on the other hand, can be understood as a form of biohacking that aims to alter the hormonal composition of the body and hack into gender codes outside of the temporal logics of Western medicine and the pharma, pharma industrial complex. Thus, we could say that actually any trans person who is using hormones can be understood as a biohacker due to the off-label use of synthetic hormones. I believe it, it is the same in Canada that uh, hormones are not intended for trans people, but they are using them off-label. I don't know if it's the same, but it's like this in, in Europe at least. Um, so trans people are using hormones in ways that actually redirect uh, the intended purpose of the drugs. Uh, but I think it's too easy to just say that every trans person is a biohacker, and I would uh, go, I would follow Hilary Malatino's um, distinction here, um, they make the distinction between neoliberal and queer biohacking that I find really, really helpful. Uh, so they describe neoliberal biohacking as a means of enhancing health, cheating death, or minimally prolonging one's lease on life. In other words, as a form of biohacking that relies on neoliberal ideas of individual hyperperformance, immortality, and also ableism, or what Alison Kafer has termed curative time, which is a time that can only perceive futurity in terms of cure and the absence of disability. Whereas queer biohacking in Malatino's definition is a collaborative, de-individuated, and is about troubling ontological boundaries and developing a collective ethics. 
And I would argue, or I do not want to suggest that trans people are necessarily engaging in a neoliberal form of biohacking, but I would argue that it's also not necessarily queer, in Martina's sense, at least. Um, coming back to Preciado once more, and I'm almost at the end of my talk. Um, in the statement I quoted before, Preciado rec recognizes his own complicity in colonial and capitalist systems through a temporality of becoming. He conceptualizes hormones, hormone time, as a temporality that connects him back to the past and to the violent histories of endocrinological research and the bio- and necropolitical power at work in the quest for raw materials which he ultimately embodies. He becomes the way of the prisoner. Preciado perceives his body as a cultural and political archive, storing past images, discourses, and practices. Thus, it seems that in contrast to the classical trans narrative, hormone time in Preciado's account seems to turn him backwards toward the past rather than propel him into the future embodiment. But, um, keep on circling back here, uh, going back to Sandy Stone's imperative that trans people have to take responsibility for all of our history and expanding her notion beyond the erasure of individual biographies, I'm wondering what does this turn to the past and his recognition of historical entanglements actually mean? Does, Preciado rec does Preciado's recognition actually take responsibility or does it remain a non-performative act to re refer to Sarah Ahmed? And to what extent does Preciado's gender hacking exceed a narrative of transgressive individuality and postmodern flexibility? From my point of view, Preciado's recognition of historical entanglements and his own positioning in networks of power still partly invokes a narrative of individual transgressive embodiment and postmodern flexibil flexibility. Even though he thinks of his subject, subjective molecular becoming as being bound to the body subjugated by the colonial capitalist flows of power that led to the production of synthetic hormones, he does not recognize how trans and gender non-conforming people, especially poor and homeless people, black trans women and trans women of color, trans people with disabilities, have, have and continue to engage in practices of gender hacking through DIY and street hormones often not as an act of self-experimentation, as Preciados is framing his um, gender hacking, but out of material necessities and as an act of survival, as they are often positioned in ways that prohibit access to medical legal recognition in the first place. In contrast, it seems that racialized and disabled subjects enter Preciados' work predominantly as subjugated subjects of the past, inscribed into his individual molecular becoming but not as subjects with histories of gender hacking, who are actively resisting and forging ways of becoming together in the here and now. And I'm, I want to give you a quote from Fanny Sosa, uh, where she's uh, putting a twist on Sojourner Truth in her text uh, that's called Biohack is Black. And she's, uh, she's writing that, why is the cyborg white? Ain't I a superwoman? Superhuman, sorry. By erasing the, history, uh, the histories of resistance, as well as their presence, Preciado positions his emerging gender-hacking subjectivity and its vision of a technosomatic communism as newly emerging and outside of radical transfeminist politics of solidarity, collectivity, and creativity, thus effectively neglecting the presence of other bodies positioned as out of time and their material, material realities, as well as resistant practices. Coming to my conclusion, I just wanted to give you that picture that I found recently in the Pharma archives, actually. I was uh, doing some research in the sharing archives, um, and I thought this picture is very, um, yeah, I love this picture so much. <laughs> Coming back to my mother's very different reactions to me being given hormones due to a rationale of hormones as either natural or artificial, invoking visions of good or bad futures, we can see through this trajectory of hormones from the invention to in the early 20th century how imaginations of time are invested in these molecules or how they are ascribed the potential to transform, straighten or disrupt temporalities, moving bodies up and down on an imagin imaginary linear timeline, placing them in or out of chrononormative notions of progress and futurity. And I want to end my presentation by asking
What forms of collectivity and solidarity and being in community with each other become possible when we deconstruct those notions of linearity, development, and progress? If, as Julian Carter argues, transition pleads time, and in doing so transforms our relational capacities, what new forms of relations can occur when we include a critique of normative notions of time into our critique of power? What kind of politics emerge when we engage in ideas of temporal justice and resistance?